But now we move on to two years later, 1993, for a different television production in a different European country, Finland. This is Hobbitit, or The Hobbits. We've got Tolkien turned into Russian fairy tale movies. We've got Tolkien turned into Finnish fairy tale movies. Before this, my only experience with either Russian or Finnish fairy tale movies was Jack Frost. Hey, doll, dairy, doll, Tom Bombadillo. Now, considering Finnish is one of the primary languages that Tolkien drew from when developing its own, I think it's only right that Finland had its own crack at a Lord of the Rings adaptation. And this was a nine-part television version of Lord of the Rings based on a six-hour play that told the story of the whole trilogy, but focused on Frodo and Sam, which means that large battles could be left out, which, you know, not a bad way to do it. So, much like Rankin Bass's Return of the King, this puts all the focus on the two hobbits. And also like Rankin Bass's Return of the King, it means they can really focus on their emotions. Don't worry, it's handled better here than it is in Rankin Bass's Return of the King. In fact, the story is narrated by an older Sam telling the tale to hobbit children. I really like that as a device, even more than I like in-universe Tolkien as a narrator. It makes sense that the hobbit who's keeping up the Red Book of Westmarch would be the one who's telling the tale to future generations. Hey, can I get some Shonaka for the story? Episode 1 is a little shadow of the past, but it's mostly riddles in the dark. The only major adaptational change to the latter is, much like in the 85 version, Gollum actually sees Bilbo put on the ring. <laughs> oh yeah, usually when someone puts on the ring, there's an explosion when they disappear. This might be a nod to Gandalf setting off a firework when Bilbo disappears at the party in the book, but it just happens indiscriminately, which is an odd choice. <laughs> but unlike the 85 version, or the Rankin Bass production, they keep the pity that stays Bilbo's hand. In fact, Sam really, really emphasizes it. <laughs> Sääli esti häntä toteuttamasta aikea. Lasi kotiin seikkailultaan kesäkuun kahdentena kymmenentenä toisena päivänä. I like these establishing shots using scale models. They're really cute. They're a little Thomas the Tank Engine-esque. From the Isle of Sodor to the Land of Mordor. Konnussa tapahtunut mitään ihmeellistä ennen kuin Herra Reppuli aloitti sadannen. So then we have Bilbo's birthday, and this older Bilbo doesn't have the button chops, but he sure does have the facial hair of a dwarf. Gandalfin maine konnussa perustui siihen, että hän käsitteli niin hyvin. Tulta ja savuja ja valoja. Mutta hänen todelliset tehtävänsä olivat paitsi vaativampia, niin myös vaarallisempia. Mutta siitä me emme konnussa mitään tiennyt. Meillähän oli vain yksi juhlien kohokohdista. These foreign Gandalfs keep on getting better and better. During the serious moments, this is the most solemn Gandalf we've seen yet, but he also has the warmth and playfulness he needs in his friendship with the hobbits. Tämä on Herra Sormus. Se Sormus, joka Sauron kadotti kauan sitten. Hän himoitsee Sormusta kovin. Mutta hänen ei tule sitä saada. I really like how he plays his temptation by the ring. Sinä olet viisas ja mahtava. Ota sinä tämä Sormus. Minua. 
We were this close to Dark Lord Gandalf, weren't we? Sorrow. This Frodo is not nearly as wormy as Soviet Frodo. In fact, he gets pretty gruff. I think that's supposed to be the power of the ring weighing on him because his voice is getting really close to Gollum's voice. Speaking of Gollum... I have not found any confirmation about whether or not Andy Serkis ever saw this production, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did because this is very close to the Gollum we know and love today, other than being played by a live actor in makeup. A live actor who incidentally is the same actor who plays Aragorn in this. Again, I assume that's a holdover from stage where roles are doubled up, but um, I'm not sure what the point of doubling up those two characters are. Like, usually in a play, when major roles are doubled up, there's a thematic reason. Like, in most stage productions of Peter Pan, Captain Hook and Mr. Darling are the same actor, but uh, I don't know what we're getting out of Gollum and Aragorn being the same actor, other than they don't have any scenes together. But the guy's good at both of them. Sormusta ei voi enää pilotella. So the hobbits head to the old forest, which, based on the music, seems to be in Eddie Valiant's office. Old Man Willow, who swallows the hobbits up using clip artifacts. And we get an older, chiller, more mellow bombadil. And a mostly off camera Barrow White, which Tom shows up to deal with without the hobbits even singing for help. Voice, hey, behold, on hub. Bombadil's not bad, but I feel like the inexplicable Soviet giant is still the most accurate, other than the inexplicable giant part. There is one scene that's added that's not in the book and doesn't focus on Frodo and Sam, and I imagine it was a scene added in the play version for a set change or something. We actually do see Gandalf give the letter to Barlam and Butterbur, and uh, it pretty much sets up their dynamic pretty well. He couldn't. They arrive in Bree, and this features the best depiction of the start of the Hey Diddle Diddle scene, with all of the awkwardness of Frodo pulling attention away to start the song. <laughs> But it still looks like Frodo pretty deliberately puts on the ring for reasons that aren't entirely clear, which I guess it's hard to film the ring accidentally slipping on his finger. What you gonna do? They meet Strider and they continue on their journey. Sitä 
nähdään. Jos taas pysyn paikalla, niin... Vedän ne puoleen. Sinä et ole yksin, Frodo. This Frodo is great. He captures the devastation he feels in the futility of the quest. No matter what choice he makes feels like the wrong one, but he can't just do nothing. Much like Soviet Fellowship, this also conflates Weathertop with the flight to the Ford, and yeah, it's just a good, efficient way to do it when you got to abridge things anyway. If I were Frodo, I'd probably be a bit alarmed to be waking up in Rivendell since it looks so much like a low-budget heaven, but hey, time for the council. Unnecessary facial hair aside, I also dig this Elrond. He's not given a whole lot to do, but he has a great presence. I love how Gimli is just every techie in your college theater department. And now, the moment you have all been waiting for, Samurai Boromir! Antakaa minulle ensin kertoa Gondorista, sillä totisesti Gondorin maasta olen minä tullut. Olisi hyvä kaikkien tietää, että vain meidän uljautemme pitää jo aloillaan idänvillit kansat ja Mordorin kaavut puolustusasemissa. Another thing that the Peter Jackson production may have taken from this is moving the discovery that Frodo's wearing Mithril to right after he gets stabbed in Moria and not a little ways after they get out of Moria. Yeah, there's no need to wonder. We have the answer, Gandalf. Also, much like Soviet Fellowship, there's no Balrog, and Gandalf just kind of seems to slip and fall, which uh, kind of takes away from all that great gravitas we've been seeing from him elsewhere. Still, at least it is confirmation that Gandalf actually fell, unlike Soviet Aragorn just kind of guessing. God, where have I seen that blue screening before? Oh yeah, I myself did it in 2003. Ha, you're gonna have to dig deep back in the Patreon if you want to see any more of that. Hyvästi Gandalf. Eikö minä sanonut sinulle, että jos kuljet Morian porteista, niin varo? Well, you didn't on camera. Then they get to Lothlorien and, um, Galadriel is the lady in the lake. Or the reflection of the lady in the lake. Tervetuloa, Aragorn, Aratornin poika. So Galadriel just lives inside her own mirror? Interesting take. They keep Gimli falling in love with Galadriel, and this Gimli is giving it his all. But it is kind of the last thing Gimli has to do in this story, and Legolas gets even less to do. No wonder Rankin Bass just cut them all together. So Samurai Boromir tries to take the ring, so Frodo and Sam go off on their own. Boromir regrets his decision, but is killed, and we actually see Aragorn's personal crisis and self-doubt. Boromir. 
Tur haluatte kannat minun. That's right. Give me that vulnerable Aragorn, baby. You know I love it. But then we just follow Frodo and Sam for the rest of the story. Narrator Sam just kind of fills in the blanks on what happened off screen. Another thing they do that Jackson would do later is move the discussion about it's a pity Bilbo didn't stab the vile creature to significantly after Shadow of the Past, except they change even more about it. Yeah, they give Frodo's lines to Sam and Gandalf's lines to Frodo. Having Frodo be the one who imparts this wisdom onto Sam really turns Sam into the true protagonist of this story, and I'm all for that. Sometimes Frodo's gruffness makes him seem a little impatient with Sam, but he still does actually appreciate Sam. It's a tricky thread. What does he know not in the bangler? Some vice sankari mielin. And yes, their take on Sauron is similar to the Soviet take on Sauron, but not nearly as goofy. I think it does work a lot better here. Faramir is completely skipped, which is better than what Jackson did to him. And much like the Balrog, Shelob is not seen, but she is mentioned by name as being off camera. It's just another scene of confusion as Frodo is clearly poisoned by something. <laughs> Yeah, basically the place that this show falls apart is anywhere there's a giant creature. Look at our size. But Sam rescues Frodo, they make their way up the mountain, Gollum attacks them, and because they drove it home so hard before, of course they keep Sam's pity for Gollum. <laughs> Then the actual climax is kind of rushed, but you know, low budget. So that's just how people fall in this version of Middle Earth, huh? I wonder if they go clockwise in Finland and counterclockwise in New Zealand. <laughs> then Sam wakes up in another heaven-looking room to be greeted by someone he thought was dead, but he's as okay with it as anybody could be. <laughs> You know, I'm okay with the way they've been rushing through set pieces if it means getting these extended scenes of characters processing their emotions. This series has a grasp on Frodo and Sam that a lot of other adaptations lack. Ja 
Kaikki hit on laulut, mitä mä olen ikinä kuullut. It probably comes from the fact that this adaptation was originally written for the stage. It's much easier to do characters processing their emotions on stage than it is to do, you know, big action scenes. And this is what you go to the theater for, to hear characters processing their emotions. Or to see big musical numbers, but this isn't that kind of show. But do you know what the best thing about this production is? Do you want to know? Do you want to know what the best part of this is? They keep the scouring! Merri puhalsi Rohanin torveen, ja ilmoille kajahti pukimaan torvimerkki. Ja pian oli koko kylä jälkeellä. Ainakin sata vantteraa hopittia, asistautuneena kirvein, karakkoi, vasaroin metsästysjousin, ja läheisiltä tiloilta tulvi koko ajan lisää väkeä. Kyläväki oli sytyttänyt soidut ihan vaan huvin vuoksi, ja siksi, että johtaja oli sen kieltänyt. Well, okay, they keep part of it. They don't actually show the hobbits confronting Saruman, but the scouring happens in this version. Is it everything I want from a scouring depiction? No, it's still this low-budget television version based on a play. It's still not perfect, but they have the scouring. As far as I know, this is the only film depiction of the scouring of the Shire. It's not the complete scouring. It's not even like a third of the scouring. I'll take what I can get. Mutta Frodo ei tullut koskaan entiselle. Ja eräänä iltana hänen aikansa oli tullut. So Frodo leaves, but not before taking one more line from Gandalf. Minä en sano, älä itke. Sillä kaikki kyyneleet eivät ole pahasta. And we get this I will remember you montage, which is kind of cheesy, but shut up, it's working on me. And then Sam finishes his story, and then he goes off towards the Undying Lands to be with Frodo. That's a nice way to end this. I like this version. Of course, not everything in it works. Some of the things that don't work are a result of their own limitations. Some of them are just creative choices that I really think are weird. But it's a mostly functional version of the complete trilogy. You know, just skipping over parts Frodo and Sam aren't in. And as far as I can tell, before Jackson came along, this was the only filmed production to finish the trilogy. And including Jackson, it's still the only production to finish the trilogy because it includes the scouring. So if nothing else, it deserves a lot of credit for that.